Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. This is episode 305, and in it, we're going to be looking at the astrology of June of 2021. Joining me today are astrologers Austin Kopic and Diana Rose Harper. Welcome, both of you. Uh, I want to start by first giving a preview of um, the astrology that we're going to talk about for June using a little animation, uh, just to give a sort of an overview for those watching the video version. And then we'll jump into a more detailed sort of introduction and discussion of unpacking the astrology for June right after that. So here's an animation that was made for us this month by the astrologer Hugh Tran in order to animate our usual monthly calendar. And June opens up with Venus ingressing into Cancer on June 2nd, followed by a solar eclipse in the sign of Gem Gemini on June 10th. After that, we get Mars moving into Leo the next day on the 11th of June, followed the following week by Saturn squaring Uranus for the second time on the 14th. Then the Sun goes into Cancer as it does on the summer solstice on the 20th every year, but also on the same day Jupiter stations retrograde in Pisces. After that, we get Mercury stationing direct in Gemini because it's been retrograde for the entire month of June up to this point. And then finally, we get uh, we come out of eclipse season and we get our first non-eclipse lunation, which is a full moon in Capricorn on the 24th of June. Uh, finally, Neptune stations retrograde in Pisces. And that's pretty much it. Oh, yeah, and then Venus goes into Venus goes into Leo on the 26th. So those are the main aspects that we're going to be covering this month in our forecast for June. All right, uh, welcome both of you to the forecast. So um, this month, Diana Rose Harper is going to be filling in for our usual co-host Kelly Surtees. Uh, Diana is an astrologer who currently lives in California. She previously appeared on the Astrology Podcast in episode 258 about a year ago, and you're also speaking at the Northwest Astrology Conference next week, right? Yeah, I'm giving two lectures and then I'm on a panel, so quite a bit of Norwacking this year. Awesome. Quite a bit of Norwacking. Austin and I have previously also done quite a bit of Norwacking in our younger days. Austin, you're not speaking at Norwack this year? <laughs> yeah. My younger days, like last year. Last year. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not I'm not speaking this year. Okay. Um, cool. Well, welcome both of you. So we're gonna spend the next hour, hour and a half talking about the astrology of June and giving a deep dive into the topic. Um, why don't we first talk about sort of the broad overview of some of the major things, and then we'll go through it chronologically. Um, so one of the things that we're, we're starting with, or, or what are the top things that we're going to be touching on or that are like the major features of June, in your opinions? Well, there's that Saturn-Uranus square, <laughs> yeah. um, which I think is the, I mean, it's the main story of 2021 in a lot of ways, and we just happened to get uh, chapter two or volume two, I feel like volume might be better than chapter uh, this month. I prefer volume. Yeah, yeah. My, my working title for this episode is uh, June 2021 Astrology Forecast Saturn Square Uranus with a Vengeance, because this is like the, the second <laughs> repeat, the second hit of Saturn Square Uranus mm -hmm. that we're going to be dealing with this month. Um, and I actually have a graph on that for from Kyle from ArchetypalExplorer.com, who's actually our sponsor this month. Uh, creates these beautiful visual astrology graphs. And this is one that shows the three exact Saturn Uranus squares that we're going to be having this year. The first one we had, of course, way back in February. Then the second one goes exact here in the middle of the month in June. And then there's a third one that's going to take place later in December. So, yeah, this is the second hit this year. And this is like the major aspect this month. Okay, so Saturn square Uranus is one of the major ones. Um, we're also getting the second half of eclipse season, and we've got a solar eclipse in Gemini. One of the things we should say at the, the very start of this episode is we're actually recording this forecast a little early because it's only, what, the 20th of May at this point. So we still have a week to go, and a lot of the most important astrology of May hasn't actually even happened yet. So for this forecast, we're going to be coming on the heels of some of that stuff that's going to take place here at the very end of May, which includes the um, station of Saturn in Aquarius, 
the Sagittarius lunar eclipse, and then also Mercury stationing retrograde on the 29th of May. So it's like all of that is the backdrop that we're moving into June with. Yeah, I would say that's more like uh, it's like the 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 pregame or the pre party for June. It's at the very end of May, but um, you know what we see at the end of May is really just um, a slightly premature introduction of June's dynamics. And of course, that Mercury retrograde um, runs for the first three entire weeks of June. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot going on in June in terms of the long term impact. Uh, uh, the Saturn Uranus square is no doubt uh, the most important thing, but we've got a lot of, as far as like uh, sort of big and noticeable things um, from within the month the Mercury retrograde, the eclipse, um, and the Saturn Uranus, as well as um, a whole month of Jupiter and Pisces, or a whole nother month of Jupiter and Pisces which, you know, Jupiter moving slowly um, takes time to, uh, to shift things in one direction or another. And we've only had that for the second half of May. Um, and that's a significantly different um, Jupiter than we've had for um, more than, well, year and a half. You know, it's not only Jupiter in a good sign, but we've had uh, Jupiter sharing a sign and getting stepped on by Saturn um for you know the rest of the the previous month of 2021 as well as all of 2020 so it's a very different jupiter yeah and i i mean i've already felt that and i've seen um a lot of that in the news i've seen other people commenting on that which is just um you know as soon as jupiter went into pisces the same day that that happened in the us the cdc announced that people that are vaccinated no longer have to wear masks either indoors or outdoors um, and there was some commentary about whether that was like premature or whether that was well planned out. But regardless, um, it was an interesting correlation with the astrology and just like a sort of breath of, you know, figuratively a breath of fresh air, but also of just optimism about some hope for the future that things might return back to some level of normal that they have not been certainly for the past year now. Yeah, absolutely. And so. Did either of you have any like fun first couple day, uh, first couple days after the ingress events that made you go, oh yeah, Jupiter's clearly in Pisces now? Yeah, actually, I um, so Jupiter in Pisces is Jupiter in my third house, and within a few days of the ingress, I had made plans to talk with people who I've like been in close relationships with in the past, but have been kind of falling out of touch. Um, and so like this week and next week and the week after I have like all of these friend conversations scheduled, um, which to me feels very Jupiter in Pisces in the third house, just like re-expanding my network and connecting with people. Totally. Third house is such a friend house. Like people often overlook that the third house is also one of the houses of friends. Yeah. Especially, you know, I tend to have really close one-on-one -on -one relationships with people. So oftentimes I feel like I'm also an only child. So my friends end up kind of occupying sibling like roles for me as well. So nice. You're one of those people that we sat down for a consultation and the astrologer starts talking about your siblings. That would not be applicable at all whatsoever, but it would be applicable in some other way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. hundred percent. That was something Lisa and I were talking about earlier this month for um, tips for getting a consultation and sometimes uh, clients not realizing that sometimes there can be ways that things connect without the immediate limited, like if you interpret it very um, stringently or very strictly, like what the astrologer is saying being true or not true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The multifaceted nature of interpretation. Right. Mm -hmm. um, what else were you saying about that or about your third house? Well, that's it. I mean, the communication component um, and um, also the busyness, like thinking about like the moon going around and like saying hi to a bunch of different people, like as the planet that joys in the third. So, yeah. Well, I like the communication thing because you're appearing on the podcast, first forecast episode, and then you're giving like how many talks next week at Norwalk? Two talks and a panel, which is three. So, okay. That's pretty, pretty good. Pretty third housey. Um, what about you, Austin? Have you had anything with Jupiter and Pisces? Yeah, well, within I think three days of the ingress, I found myself um, floating 
languorously on a boat on a lake um, for like a day of leisure, like surrounded, uh, surrounded by happy people in the sunshine, just like doing uh, water activities. <laughs> I don't know. I can't think of water sports without thinking of something else. So I was trying to avoid that. <laughs> um, but anyway, people were really enjoying their water sports. I was not participating. I um, I was very happy to simply float along on the boat. I was like, oh, this is nice. Um, and the people I was with, like, the, all the dynamics were unusually good. The children were well-behaved. Well, not too well-behaved. That would be sick and unnatural. But, like, no, it was just nice. It was just, it was just like, oh, this is so nice. Um, and I was like, oh, so Jupiter's in a water sign, huh? And everybody's on the water and enjoying it. It's, it's also given me um, just some food for thought. Um, thinking uh, in regard to Jupiter very strong in a water sign as opposed to Jupiter very strong in a fire sign, which we had a couple years ago. Um, and just seeing the water significations has been really clear. Like, obviously, in my case, it was literal. Uh, but Diana, as you were saying, like the, the reconnecting is, um, you know, <laughs> Uh, for some reason, I, I keep stumbling into double entendres that I'll try to avoid. I was going to say reconnecting PG is a astrologically like moist activity. Like <laughs> what is wet, like connects people, right? Like you soup brings all the ingredients together, right? Like the water signs are the emotional connecting signs. Yeah. I was thinking about that recently just because water is the is the element that will most like morph and adapt to whatever it's touching or whatever it's around. And that's one of the reasons why water signs get some of the qualities that they get with Cancer and Scorpio and Pisces is just that highly, highly adaptable. But also I think that's where the um empathy comes from, the tendency for water signs to be able to almost experience what other people are experiencing it's because of that adaptability and that ability to morph to you know take on the shape or feel the way some someone or something else feels because of that yeah there's also the the fact of water dissolving other substances and taking those substances into itself it's still water but now it's really salty water or really lemony water or really dirty water like muddy water mm. yes <laughs> Right, like it still has that baseline of being water, but its basic nature has changed because of what it has absorbed. I really like that analogy. Although, as a water sign, I'm going to substitute. I'm going to say, let's say, flowery smelling water for. Oh yeah, hydrosols. Uh, hydrosols are wonderful. Okay. Right, it's like water that takes on the qualities of a given plant in really beautiful ways. Right. Right. Or even alcohol. Yeah. Right. And, and I can Pisces. confirm that Chris has a delightful floral scent. <laughs> That's true. He's actually it's been kind over of to a my chrysanthemum house. Sort of vibe, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, we sat for a week actually when Jupiter was in Sagittarius in that last little trip. Uh, so recording like podcasts back to back, and I was just rewatching some of those the other day. So you you do have a very intimate like knowledge of my my scent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so that, let's that get back. Yeah, one that, thing that actually. Six I, hours into podcasting bouquet. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, one thing, so Jupiter went into Pisces, and one thing I did with Aquarius Rising is I was working at a deal with um, people are always asking me what software I use when we're like animating the chart. Uh, so I use Solar Fire, a program called Solar Fire from alabe.com which is available for Windows, and you can use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. But people are always asking me what software to get for Mac, and there's actually a program that's very similar to Solar Fire called Astro Gold, and I finally worked out a deal with them and have been using the program, and it's really nice because it works just like Solar Fire and also has the animate chart feature. But I worked at a deal with them where listeners of the podcast can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount on that program through their website at astrogold.io. So they've been integrating a lot of traditional astrology techniques like zodiac releasing and perfections and other stuff recently. So it's actually a pretty good and comparable program to Solar Fire at this point. So now all the people that use Macs are no longer in the wilderness for you know, having a good astrology program to use, which was the case for many, many years. 
Yeah, that's what I use. Actually, I use Astro Gold and I capital L love it. So Yeah, well, it makes a difference because especially most people, I don't know if this is still the case, but like 10, 15 years ago, everyone just used astro.com and there was always like this transition point where it's like eventually you have to get software, but you don't really know fully why or how useful it's going to be. But some of those features in terms of saving as many charts as you want or being able to animate the chart are really useful Like as a consulting astrologer and speeding up and improving your practice. I feel like in a way that you don't realize until you sort of get it and it becomes just second nature. Yeah, hundred percent. That was my experience. I mean, and even like people in the chat are talking about Astro Gold on phones. Like that's actually what convinced me to upgrade on my computer was just being able to do certain sorts of things so much faster um, than you can do on just Astro.com. Yeah, uh, I use Astro Gold on my Android phone. Um, so you can find out more information about that at AstroGold.io. All right, so let's get back to the forecast. So we were talking about Jupiter and Pisces. Um, one of the Jupiter and Pisces things that happened that I wasn't paying attention to, but it did coincide with the ingress of Jupiter into Pisces is there's been all of these sudden like disclosures from the US military about unidentified flying objects and a lot of discussion then about you know what this means and if this is like a legitimate thing or if it's just um a hoax or like a lens aberration or something like that. Um, I wasn't really paying attention, but Lisa actually was like, no, you should actually really look at this. There's something weird happening here. And we sit down and watched like a 60 minutes ran a special on it this week where they're interviewing actual like military personnel who are describing things that they saw back in 2004 or other times um, that they couldn't explain as like unexplained aerial phenomenon. Um, and I thought that was really interesting and perhaps tied into the Jupiter and Pisces theme, which interestingly we talked about as travel or like travel opening up, since Jupiter, of course, is the main planet of travel. But one thing that we did not really take into account as a perhaps possible extension of travel is like, you know, intergalactic or otherworldly like sort of travel um, that might occur with a, a Jupiter sign as well. Mm-hmm. Have you two seen anything about this or how do you feel? Yeah, I've been uh, super fascinated by it um, because I have my own like actual personal like witnessing of like maybe UFOs from the Driftless region of Wisconsin, which is a super weird place if you've never been there. Um, But, you know, like what we were talking about in the pre-show chat, I guess, um, of the, the Neptunian influence here as well as like the um like one of the things i was mentioning earlier of um kind of this flash of insight of like oh here's this thing that is maybe real but also still having so much that we haven't that we don't have answers to right it's like okay there are unidentified flying objects but what are they where do they come from who's driving them like yeah, I mean, even even the name um, tells you it, it, confirming a UFO means confirming that there's a thing that you don't know what it is, right? Like you're you're still confirming a lack of um, knowledge or information about something. I've seen any. I've seen one UFO. It was that uh, it couldn't have been anything else. It was also in a weird place. Uh, we were driving. Um, we were driving uh, through Mount Shasta. And I just looked up and saw a thing. And I was like, okay, now I've seen a UFO. And of course it was at Shasta. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what it was. Um, planes can't do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was so not I like that. that's uh, abducted good... or introduced to alien technology. No, that's too bad. I like probed or questioned or hypnotized. Well, as far as you know, uh, but I like that. So confirmation. So Jupiter going into Pisces because that's a major theme. That because Jupiter is still kind of far away, it's going to station this month in like what one degree first or second degree of Pisces, and Jupiter is way back at twenty two degrees of Pisces. But as we've always really harked on in this podcast and emphasized every time, like as soon as a planet moves into a sign with another planet. They're they're basically together, and their energies start mixing and start blending in a significant way, even if they have a large degree of spatial distance by degree that they start rubbing off on each other at that point. So 
we really do have to take into account that Jupiter is not just moved into its home sign of Pisces and is not just stationing there this month, but is now co-present with Neptune. And so Jupiter's transit through Pisces is going to be significantly colored by um, that configuration with Neptune. So I like that delineation you mentioned of confirmation of a mystery. So it's not really even confirmation yet of we know what this is, but instead it's a disclosure of there's a bunch of these sightings and the the US military is at least acknowledging we have no idea what this is, but there's something going on and they say it could be, you know, a number of different things, but one of those things that it could be, I guess, is is extraterrestrial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the, there's an additional layer of Neptune around it as well. Um, a lot of people naturally question the U.S. military's motives, um, like why. Like the, there's been this kind of stuff on the books, and people have tried to talk. Like um, former military officers have tried to talk about this kind of stuff for decades and decades, and so people are asking, like, well, why? Why are they talking about it now? Mm-hmm. Right, like, mm-hmm. and you know, I don't have an answer to that, um, <laughs> or or a pet theory or whatever. But there's like an additional level of mystery. It's like, okay, but but why now? Why talk about it now? Well, well, one of the things was that there was a guy a couple of years ago that was a high up guy that had access to some of these stories, and he was um, angry that he didn't understand why the military wasn't doing anything about it and wasn't talking about it, and there wasn't funding into investigating it. So he leaked a bunch of some of the videos to the New York Times, and um, I forget when this was because I remember there was something back when either Saturn moved over the galactic center in Sagittarius or when Jupiter moved over the galactic center, which would have been like late 2019. But one of those disclosures of leaks of some of these videos came out at that time because I think I remember us mentioning it in passing on like a forecast episode. Um, But that's a little bit of what happened over the past couple of years is they've sort of had their hand forced by, um, you know, leaks basically. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, Jupiter and Pisces, that's one of the interesting things we'll have to talk about and continue to think about, especially since we'll have an intensification of some of that Jupiter and Pisces energy this month with Jupiter stationing in Pisces, um, but then also that giving us a bit of a preview of some things to come. So maybe the confirmation of mysteries as one of our themes that we'll continue to explore with Jupiter and Pisces in the future. Mm-hmm. Yes, as well as the um, the luxuries of boating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, but right. um, just to speak to that point you made about uh, Jupiter and Neptune being co-present and that <clears throat> being something to take into account. I'm actually really liking that they're so far apart for a while because it means it's easier to focus on one or the other for a given election or transit or whatever. Um, because next year, um, you know, they spend a lot of um they spend a lot of the second part of Jupiter's time in Pisces much closer together. And it will be very difficult to disentangle them. Right. Like there's there's commingling as it is, but it's, you know, with a with a sign, I usually think in terms of um if a sign is um is a house, <clears throat> that sounds more confusing than it should be. If a if a sign is a domicile, a dwelling place, a structure, and the planets are like in uh inhabitants, then whenever you have two planets in the same sign, they're both um they're housemates, right? But when they get close enough, then they you know, let's say within six degrees, they live in the same room. And then maybe within three degrees, they sleep in the same bed. And it becomes becomes much more difficult to disentangle them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm just uh, animating the chart, taking us forward to next year and even the following year where, oh, it doesn't go back into Pisces. So yeah, but next year it gets that exact conjunction with Neptune uh, Jupiter does as it's going through Pisces about almost a year from now, mm-hmm. around 23, 24 degrees of Pisces. Um, so Jupiter's stationing, there's an intensification of some of that Jupiter energy this month, but also um, a sort of pivot and the turning point where it starts looking backwards because Jupiter has unfinished business in Aquarius still. And that's a major theme of unfinished business and starting the process of returning back to something that you had finished or revisiting an action that you've taken earlier, not just with Jupiter stationing 
in order to begin its journey backwards and retracing its steps into Aquarius, um, but also Mercury having stationed at the very end of May in Gemini and then retracing its steps and moving back into the earlier degrees of Gemini, I think will bring a similar feeling um, with some, some actions that people took in May having to be revisited uh, during the course of June as Mercury slows down and moves, moves backwards. Mm-hmm. You, before, actually, Chris, before we move on to Mercury, I wanted to say one more thing about Jupiter and the retrograde. Um, so one of the things that I noticed about <clears throat> Jupiter's movement to Pisces was its absence in Aquarius. And when the moon was in Leo a few days ago, um, and it was aspecting the planets in Aquarius, um, I, you know, I've, been, I've gotten used to this rhythm every month where a planet will first aspect Saturn and then the next day or later that day, it'll then um, tr- transition into an aspect to Jupiter, right? And so there was this like, oh, harshness of Saturn, and then Jupiter like mollifying that or uplifting it a little bit. And I noticed that um, to a certain degree, Aqu- Aquarius is now a harsher place uh, than it was two weeks ago. Um, you know, the the total Jupiter gain is probably, you know, there. There's probably like a total Jupiter level gain. Um, but Aquarius is a harsher place now. I noticed that with some house stuff with my chart and others. Yeah, and and that's gonna we're gonna feel that more intensely here over the next few weeks because Saturn's gonna station in Aquarius at 13 degrees, and so we're gonna get an intensification also of Saturn um, over the next few weeks. I mean, this is happening in the next few days, basically at the end of May. But I think that's a significant. To whatever extent we're already feeling that, that feeling should get a little more intense. I've been feeling that as an Aquarius rising recently, when um, because it's also coming up to my ascendant, and I saw that um last night I was trying to like go to sleep and get plenty of sleep in preparation for this episode, but I saw on Facebook that a couple of guys that I grew up with had gotten married in the past few years, and I didn't really know, and my initial thought was like they're they're too young to get married. How are these guys that I New as kids getting married, and then I thought a little bit and realized, oh wait, we're all in our mid thirties at this point. Actually, <laughs> that's what happens. And one one had like a kid that was now going off to college, and and I was having like serious Saturn transit mid thirty crisis at about like two a.m. last night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Do you felt you guys felt that with the any Saturn transits at any point? No, I've accepted that I'm old, Chris. Okay. Yeah, I mean, You're I started. Past this. I started getting gray hairs when I was twelve. So, okay, I can appreciate that. Um, yeah, gray hairs or hair loss things mm-hmm. as a Saturn transit is always a fun, unexpected transit as an astrologer. Mm-hmm. But, um, but you know, to be more serious, yeah, I, I found um, I can remember back when I was your age, um, <laughs> and that that waxing Saturn square is, um. It, there's a, uh, I don't know, there are a lot of feelings and thoughts, and that one really seems to bring a lot of like recognition of where you're at in life and, you know, what being your age means. And because you're just like when you're, um, let's say 36, 37, you're not, you're definitely not young, but you're also not old. You're probably not even middle aged yet, but like you're not young. Or like that's, that's how it, process for me and often does with people people probably get different things about it but it's a you know it's a saturn saturn aspect um not you know it's not an opposition or a return but it's like there's a real contemplation of time and your place in it Mm -hmm. yeah for sure the the waxing saturn square the first hard aspect after the saturn return uh in your late 30s or late 20s yeah, and that the Saturn square often also the waxing Saturn square in the mid thirties uh, also often coincides with the um, maturation year of Saturn, um, which is commonly used in Vedic astrologies. Oh, right. The Saturn maturation is thirty six in Vedic. Mm-hmm. So cool. that that always times to around the Saturn square of Saturn, at least by sign. Okay, so so that's another backdrop thing sh- people should be paying attention to as we head into June is just that Saturn station in Aquarius, especially if you have like second decan of fixed sign or Aquarius placements in your chart um, that that can sneak up on you those stations sometimes in terms of their importance. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, Uranus, I mean, that leads us into the Saturn Uranus square, which is going to be our main aspect this month. Um, because when Saturn starts retrograding and moving back, Uranus is actually moving pretty quick at this point, and it catches up in squares Saturn mid month on the 14th. Mm-hmm. So that's another thing is it's not just a Saturn transits if you have stuff in the second deck and the fixed signs, but we're also getting some heavy Uranus transits at the same time. Mm-hmm. And then Mars will join the fixed sign party before too awful long. Yep. Yes. But so maybe, that- but maybe let's tarry a bit in the non Mars version before we, um, you know, uh, charge forward. Yes. Thank you. Um, Saturn square Uranus. Um, let's talk wait, before we get into that about the eclipses because that's the other thing we're heading into this month with is, um, you know, we're fully in eclipse season by the time we get to June because we have that first eclipse that we talked about last month in Sagittarius, which is taking place on the 26th of May. Um, but then it's complemented by a Gemini solar eclipse on the 10th of June. So at this point, we are fully in the Sagittarius-Gemini eclipse axis, and this is a continuation, of course, of the Sagittarius-Gemini eclipse series that really got going late last year at the end of November and early December. Um, one of the funny things I noticed about that was at the end of November, there was a, a lunar eclipse in Gemini, and on that very day, Bitcoin suddenly rose and hit the highest price. It exceeded the highest price that it had ever gotten to, which was, I think, like $20,000 in value on the day of the Gemini lunar eclipse. And I really took note of that astrological correlation. And then I did an, an uh, episode with astrologer Robert Weinstein on um, the astrology of Bitcoin, like a week later, or something like that. And then shortly after that, the price of Bitcoin just skyrocketed over the next few weeks or the next couple of months to be up to what did it get to, Austin? Like sixty thousand or something like that. Something I, I think high fifties. I, I don't really follow Bitcoin. I mean, as a thing that's happening in the world that's interesting, and I, I, I feel like whenever I hear about Bitcoin, I just feel like I'm getting a status update on Uranus in Taurus. A status update, a status update of Uranus and Taurus, right? Yeah, because it, historically, there it's there's it's always like one of the things that it's always about is currency and valuation, and what has value, what's a good store of value, what's stable, what's unstable, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So there's been a lot of um, you know that the price basically over the past few days or just yesterday, I guess, suddenly tanked. It's been. Um, it was growing for a long time and suddenly tanked. Um, and one of the interesting pieces of that was um, Elon Musk announced on Twitter that that um, Tesla was no longer being, going to be using Bitcoin or accepting it for purchasing cars. And he said something about the environmental impact that it had in terms of its use of energy. And I thought that was an interesting development of the Uranus and Taurus sort of symbolism in terms of the impact of technology on the environment and things related to the environment um, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's interesting thinking about how Bitcoin is aligning with both the eclipse cycle that we're in and the Saturn-Uranus cycle, like point in the cycle that we're in, um, and thinking a lot about where people are putting their faith, like what people believe in, as well as how believe, you know, thinking about the Sag Gem axis. And then with the Saturn Uranus square, how that applies to the concrete um, methods of living, I guess, or like what allows us access to resources. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I think it's an interesting it's an interesting dynamic between those two current astrological patterns. Right, for sure. Um, yeah, I'm not a huge person into Bitcoin either, Austin, but it's just uh, it keeps increasingly dominating the news and seems to increasingly be dominating some like markets and, and attention towards markets and things like that. And you know, that was something we talked about way before when we were anticipating Uranus going into Taurus. And it's interesting seeing that play out. And you know, we'll probably see that continue to play out over the course of the next. We're only halfway through the sign, not even there at this point. So we still have a long ways to go. Yeah, we're like coming up on the halfway point, 
like I think end of this year. Um, yeah, um, people tried to turn me on to Bitcoin years ago, and I realized that um, in order to really do it, you have to make it a part time job. And I was like, I've already got like two or three full time jobs, so I can't do that. But um, so here's the thought <clears throat> um, to tie because uh, you, as you, you both already pointed out um bitcoins um a lot of the bitcoin story over the last year has been really tied into the eclipse cycle and so we have this um very interesting solar eclipse in gemini coming up um on the north node on rahu um that also happens to be very tightly conjunct within a degree um a, a retrograde mercury um which is of course the ruler of gemini so it's very it's a very gemini uh, solar eclipse. It's a very mercurial solar eclipse. And it just occurred to me that it's shocking that it hasn't occurred to me before that um, if we're looking at the simple like more function of the North Node, that it, the North Node in Gemini is um, uh, accelerating the rate of digitization and virtualization. Um, it's, um, you know, it's moving things offline or, uh, into more, how should we say like tech, uh, technically complex digital forms, whether that's education or money or whatever. Um, and that this, uh, this eclipse cycle, this, uh, this pair of signs, North node in Gemini and South node in Sag has absolutely coincided with a, like a, a massive leap forward, um, and sort of unbalanced push forward, which is usually kind of how you get more with Rahu or the North node. It's usually not smooth. It's like jumpy. Um, and that that's, that's like, I don't know. It's just obviously right there. And I can't believe I never um, put that together clearly before. <laughs> I don't know if that was clear, but it was clear to me. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And especially thinking of, about um, the nervous system plugin with Mercury and how like people are, are experiencing massive amounts of Zoom fatigue, as well as um, the nervous system overwhelm of constant exposure to news cycle things of things that are horrible all over the world. Um, yeah, like the increased awareness that doesn't necessarily support well-being all the time. Or, or, or really ever. Or ever, <laughs> or, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, occasionally, <laughs> incidentally, it, it may support well-being. Mm -hmm. It's interesting with that over the past year, with the increase, as you're saying, in like people using Zoom to talk and communicate, and an, an increase in that with the North Node going through Gemini, with the simultaneous like decrease in travel and sort of human interaction over the past year due to the pandemic. Um, and it just makes me think of those fundamental meanings of the nodes of the North node and in, in increase and the South node and decrease. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And then, so that's interesting because um, there are some traditional texts that will say that the North node is exalted in Gemini. And since, um, since it since it went in last year, I've been sort of chewing on that, um, like a piece of strange tasting gum, deciding what I thought about that and if that was something that I could see, um, or you know, just just considering it. And so, I guess now, if I think about how, in many ways, how much more mercurial things have become over the last uh over the last year like how much more um like techie digital talk 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 information information um many people's lives have become um and if i see the exaltation as like exaltations are it means that the planet is really good or the planet or the 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 node in this case is really good at what it likes doing not necessarily good at what we like um i'm i'm tempted to to strongly agree um, this is certainly very strong uh, jump forward. Um, Rahu seems like it's been very good at doing uh, his job. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, yeah. So um, that eclipse is going to be major, major Gemini energy. You know, we're coming into it with Sagittarius energy with the lunar eclipse in Sagittarius that ends May. Um, but then there's just this huge concentration of that Gemini energy around the time of that that eclipse, um, around the 10th of of June, because it's not just in Gemini, 
very close to the North Node, uh, but also has that retrograde Mercury conjoining it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, on a personal level, what do either of you think that will might feel like or indicate? Um, I'm personally. I mean, I- Go ahead. I was going to say, I'm personally anticipating um, deliberately not being on any technological devices uh, for the days surrounding that as much as possible, um, just because I personally have been feeling that over overstimulation um, and you know thinking about where that's landing in my own natal chart, anticipating the sensation of problem instead of clarity or like clarity that uh, how do I even put this? Um, especially with that retrograde Kazemi about to happen, um, insights that are uncomfortable for mm-hmm. me personally. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so being cautious personally. That makes yeah, sense. It kind of screams like really deep or fundamental um, rethinking of some topic like with all the Gemini stuff, like seeing going down to the matrix code level Mm -hmm. of a particular part of life and seeing the code or the, you know, what's creating the patterns and perhaps having a bit of a, a a shock. Right. Um, And, you know, to a certain degree, you know, knowledge is empowerment. If it allows you to gives you access to, um, to rewrite the code, but it can also be like, uh, a bit much, right? Which is sort of one way to put the North Node's more function is what is more, what what is more, more, more can sometimes <laughs> or oftentimes end up being a bit much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I keep thinking of it coinciding with just an increase, the Gemini emphasis this month being an increase in socialization and people being reacquainted to and remembering having social lives, partially because, for example, in the US, the percentage of the population is what up to like 60% or 70% that's been immunized at this point or has gotten the vaccine. And people are starting to socialize again, but then it's kind of fu- after a year of having limitations or restrictions on that. But then it's kind of funny because there's sometimes stories of, the problems or being reacquainted with some of the problems of socializing or some of the um, drawbacks of that, like something as simple as like there was something about like lines, huge lines at Disneyland and like people not being able to like get on rides or like going there because it's just packed with people who are trying to go back to normal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, um, um, it was hell finding parking at the lake. Mm-hmm. Um, really? We went out, okay. Kate and I went out to eat the other day. Um, they're like, yeah, it's a two hour wait. Right, people mm-hmm. like it's um what is a bit of a log jam out there. Yeah, I drove past Eaton Canyon, which is like a nature area up here recently, and it was a weekday, weekday afternoon, really beautiful day. But there was a line of cars that you know, even before you get into the proper gate, I saw maybe like 35, 40 cars waiting to just get in to that area. Um. So even thinking about like the the hunger and that like sense of like, you know, thinking about this as like a solar eclipse new moon situation of just like that emptiness of socialization combined with the north node and just like greedy shoveling of uh, interaction, um, which sounds like a recipe for getting too much, right? Like the stomach ache after uh, overindulgence. I like that. So having an an overindulgence of socializing uh, this month is one of our our keywords. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, that's pretty good. And also, I like that that brings up, you know, we just have to emphasize that this is tied into a broader eclipse series. Uh, It's definitely tied into the ones from November 30th and December 14th of last year, and some things that were initialized then sort of um, being brought to fruition around this time. So, uh, you know, I remember, for example, the first person that received the first official dose of the vaccine in the US that actually occurred on December 14th, which was the uh, solar eclipse in Sagittarius, um, which was the same day of the solar eclipse. And that's also, as we mentioned back then, that's the rising sign of the United States in the US Sibley chart, which is an interesting correlation there. 
So um, having the other end of that six months later with the eclipses, I assume, is something connected with that as well in terms of maybe reaching sort of a turning point in terms of whatever was initiated at that time with the vaccination efforts. And um, yeah, maybe it's like hitting the peak of that because I know it started to slow down recently, right? So they're trying to encourage more people to do it. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there might be like an additional spike in um, vaccination as other people witness uh, others hot girl summering because they've gotten vaccinated. Right. <laughs> like the uh, the social pressure or like the um, everybody else is doing it pressure. Yeah. Well, then we also have the Mercury retrograde is stationing around the same degree that Venus went retrograde a year ago. And I remember so much of that at the time was Venus slowing down in late Gemini and stationing, and some of the restrictions led up at that time, and people thought it was time to go back to normal after like two or three months of intense lockdown. But then the COVID numbers just started spiking again, and it turned out that that was kind of like the idea that we were done with it and it was over at that point and could go back to normal was kind of a mirage. And I, I always connected with that with the Venus stationing squaring Neptune at the same time. So it's interesting that we have Mercury stationing around the same degrees in Gemini square Neptune this year, and I wonder if there isn't some sort of echo of that that we might um, experience over the course of the next month. Yeah, that's a really good point, Chris. Yeah, so we'll see how that goes. Um, eclipse series, and just remembering that this is tied into that, so that can sometimes for certain people have a very personal meaning for you. Um, so pay attention to what houses the eclipse fell. Eclipses fell in your chart in Sagittarius and Gemini last November and December, and any sort of themes um, that were initiated at that time, uh, especially great endings or great beginnings. And you should see a continuation of that story or another chapter of that story beginning around this time with these two eclipses in the same signs of Gemini and Sagittarius. Um, so that's more. You know, personalizing some of this stuff a bit and taking it down from like the mundane level to the personal level, just in terms of thinking about what house those eclipses are falling in your chart. Yeah, one mm, method of interpretation that I would recommend is just to look at the pair of houses that the nodes are in and look look at how uh, you know over the last year especially in the last 6 months there's been a, like a reprioritization or a, sh a shuffling back and forth between what's going on um in in each of those respective houses generally even though it's a, there's a back and forth there's generally tends to be um a removal um of energy, money, uh, attention from an extraction of attention energy from the si the house where the south node is, and then the sign that the north node is in tends to end up with more. It's not a simple um, load up the moving truck and um, you know make one trip. There's a back and forth, but it's a back and forth that tends to pull in one direction, especially to result um, in the north node house getting more attention usually because it needs it mm -hmm. but there's always like stuff to finish up um you know we talk about the south node and letting go um and you know letting go can be wonderful um but often you got to kind of get things done before you can let them go or you've got to get them to a point before you let them go and it's like oh, okay i gotta do this this and this and then i can stop worrying about that Right. I saw I saw a friend who has the eclipses falling in his um he's like Pisces rising, so he has the eclipses falling in his uh fourth and tenth house axis. And he moved across the country for the first time, I think, in his adult life and relocated it and got a new house, but then also lost his um Twitter account, which he was like a major platform for him. So there's like major shifts with respect to both his career as well as his home and living situation. And I thought that was a great example of sometimes that that back and forth that eclipses can do when they're sometimes wreaking havoc. You could look at it from that perspective, but another perspective is, is again, just that idea of great endings and great beginnings mm -hmm. um, well, in whatever we, houses they're falling. We also know somebody um, with Pisces rising, um, which would put the south node in their 10th house who is um, Conspicuously absent from this podcast right now. 
Mm -hmm. Right. Because they are attending to fourth house matters of mm -hmm. returning oh, yeah, to their point. home on another continent. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, this is also reminding me of something that um, my friend Bear, Bear River, has uh, talked with. We've talked about this at length of how um, acquisition often requires sacrifice. And I feel like that can be uh, like a concise way to think about um like what are you acquiring in the house where the North Node is transiting? And what does that mean in terms of what you're sacrificing in wherever your south wherever the South Node is transiting? Yeah, absolutely. I, I like to use a hands metaphor. If we're talking about letting go and grasping, right? We do that with our hands. In order to really grab something with both hands, it means that those hands can't be holding on to something else. Mm -hmm. Right. And a lot of times we're, you know, we're trying to do two or three or five things at once. And it's sort of like, okay, I got to, got to free up this, you know, the, the release of a hand is so it can do something else, not so that it can, you know, persist in some sort of detached, um, utopian permanent state. Yeah. In the words of Killer Mike, can't pick up no crown holding what's holding you down. I like that. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> good. It's good. <laughs> Philosopher. Uh, so yeah, you only have two hands, so you can only hold so many things. That's a good keyword for this month. Unless of course you are one of our interdimensional friends where we don't want to make any assumptions about how many hands they yeah. may, may or I'm may sure the hands are finite, even if they are made. Yeah. Okay. I mean, but even thinking about, so like when we were talking about aliens, I was thinking about one of my favorite movies, which is Arrival. Highly oh, yeah. recommend. <laughs> Makes like me cry every single time. But Charlie, there's, Charlie Sheen. Yeah. There's heptapods. Right. And mm. they have, you know, aliens with multiple hands and they speak a language that transcends time. It's great. Yeah. That was a great, that was a good movie. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So we've dwelt a little bit on the two eclipses because we got to treat them as a pair. Uh, we've talked about looking at those in terms of what houses they're falling in your chart. Um, one of the things to go back to the Saturn. Uranus square before we get into like the more difficult part of it, which is basically the entire second half of the month when Mars goes into Leo and starts opposing and squaring that is um we had talked in one of the previous forecasts when the sec the first Saturn Uranus square was going exact about the whole GameStop fiasco and all of the um individuals that were like banding together on social media in order to um Make moves with the markets and like invest in certain things. And there was like these weird power struggles going on with more wealthy investors and things like that. And it was an interesting manifestation of the, uh, that sort of energy of that time of some of the tensions in the collective. And I know, Austin, that you were thinking we might see something more like that or a continuation of similar dynamics. Oh, I mean, yeah, I think that the, the Saturn Uranus squares have shown themselves really clearly. I mean, really, even last uh, last spring when we we got the like the toe dip from Saturn, and then when Saturn uh, came back into Aquarius, like um, its challenges to existing systems, its uh, its volatility, its challenges. There's its shocks, right? Like in one way that we can look at the GameStop thing um, is that it's um, you know, is it a, uh, how do we put this? It's, it's a challenge almost, it was almost, um, like, a a mockery of the, of the financial system. Um, but enacting it, enacting its own logic in such, but taking it to a level where the ridiculousness is clear. Right. And it's, you know, in it's, in its own way, um, uh, it's worth calling it a protest in some ways or a demonstration it had a, it had other purposes um but it's very much like a child like a, um a collective challenge to a system right and it's um the saturn uranus things aren't th these are they're very not individual i was just thinking of the the language that we were using in february um which was flocking of like people coming together assembling sort of into one larger structure um, pretty quickly and out of nowhere and then dispersing quickly. And a flock of birds just flew, um, right in front of my window, like four birds together. So, um, the omen says that is the right language to use. 
Um, but it, it's that kind of like rapidly assembling to do a thing and then dispersing. I think that we'll probably see several different versions of that. Yeah, there's like a, a word that's coming to mind or like a phrase that's coming to mind is like the satire of the chorus. Yeah. Um, and then like I'm I'm like there's a there's a name, and I'm sure somebody is gonna be able to drop this in the chat, but like flash mob, that's what it is. Like also mm. like the flash mob component where it's like, you know, when flash mobs were really a thing, it's like people getting together and like all dancing a choreo choreographed dance, just like a sudden like theatrical performance. But what does it mean whenever we're applying that to the literal infrastructure of how people access resources? It feels super Uranus Saturn to me. Yeah, it's like a flash mob, but there's less like people dancing in a mall and more people like destroying and tearing down existing structures uh -huh. in society. Yeah. Yeah. Which like, you know, thinking even about like satire of the chorus of like um like that's it's also making me think about Adrian Marie Brown's work of pleasure activism of like what does it mean to like joyously destroy something? There's like almost like a, a like a Dionysian or like Bacchanal component to that, where it's like the gleefulness of the GameStop situation was really striking to me. Um Yeah, there's like a group component as well where it becomes there's like a group think component where people in groups get hyped up and do stuff or sometimes go further than they would have as individuals that was like a real sense i was getting at the time both with the gamestop thing as well as some of the stuff that was happening with social media and stuff at the time yeah um, i mean as well also the stuff that happened at the capitol whatever you want to call that particular event it's like you know any one of those individuals like independent from that group situation probably would not have gone to that level but the like Bacchanalic groupthink component, um, yeah, like the dark side of the Bacchanal versus, you know, like the main ads, like ripping apart the sacrificial victim versus the joyous drinking and carousing. Yeah. It made me think of like the French Revolution as well at the time, uh, because that was another example of things that were taken to an extreme and then sometimes things get taken to such an extreme and people afterwards look back and wonder how people could have gone that far but then when you're sort of observing it at the time you see some of the dynamics of people in groups hyping each other up to such an extent that they'll go to much greater extremes than they otherwise would have mhm mm mhm mm yeah, so we get the second Saturn Uranus square, and I think that's going to be part of the energy this month, especially in June, with that. And so, um, sorry, Chris, I want to add one more thing. Um, we just had a storm roll in, and so my internet flashed out for a second. Sure. Which is, you know, um, it's, it's the part of a problem when you spend the first part of the day calling uh, Jupiter the rain bringer. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, the we we were talking about this a little bit earlier, um, and that was the we're talking about Saturn Uranus. Um, I don't think we will be able to tell the story of Saturn Uranus without talking about labor, mm -hmm. um, and labor in like in a you know sort of traditional organized way, like the the sort of widely dispersed push and pressure towards uh, unionization. Um, especially in tech, is most notably with Amazon, um, but also the how do I put it the the phenomenon where a lot of a number of companies in the U.S. are not finding that their low wage jobs are being enthusiastically filled, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and yeah. the, the um, you know the the questions about work and the value of work um, that had been brought up from people taking, in many cases for a lot of um, adults, it's like the first, you know, people were off out of work for six months or whatever. They were, there was a, a stepping, a time to, excuse me, there was a stepping away and there was time to rethink what work is maybe for the first time in a decade or more. Yeah. And also the time to like actually consider what one truly values beyond the um, constant struggle for survival that is the attempt to receive sufficient resources to live in a money-based context, right? So, you know, um, even thinking about how so many of the people who ha lost their low-wage jobs 
were parents of some kind. Um, and then, you know, actually being able to spend time with your children and recognizing that you're not spending money, uh, having someone else spend time with your children. Um, and what is the, what is the appropriate level of compensation to be selling your time and energy away from that, which is your true priority on a human level? Yeah. Like this feels a lot more meaningful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just like even thinking about Uranus and Taurus as like a disruption or like a like a a shaking awake of what aspects of our material existence truly matter to us like even thinking about you know Venus as the ruler of Taurus as um like a reminder of that which we materially crave near us and like Uranus being like hey do you crave slaving away for people who treat you rudely instead of spending time with the people that you love? Like that, I think, is really uh, up right now. I heard a point made that I think is worth sharing is really interesting, that for people who shifted from working in an office to working at home, um, that stripped away all of the like the the like the relationships from work like work wasn't where you like you know hang out and talk a little bit and mm. like there's social stuff good bad and other that kind of engages you and it feels more like real life whereas like it on the laptop it's only the work mm -hmm. like that's all there is um and that that stripping away of those other elements um laid bare what the actual labor was and how we relate to it yeah, that's making me think about the conversations that have been happening about parasocial relationships on social media and how people will think that they know someone simply because they follow them in a devoted way. <laughs> um, and, you know, the parasocial relationship of the workplace, particularly, you know, I know I have worked in these sorts of contexts where there's um, this strange manipulation of like, you spend all our time all your time with us and we're like family. And so because we're like family, you're going to sacrifice more than you would otherwise for us. Right. Right. Like yeah, it's okay right. if we exploit you because you're family and it gets like into this mm -hmm. really dark, horrible place. It's like, if you're not actually hanging out with people and your Slack interactions are clarifying that, um, no, these aren't people who I agree with or who matter to me or who I would like, you know, run away with should shit hit the fan. Sorry. I cussed. Is that okay? I always forget. if I can. I mean, this is a family, sh this PG-13, but I think you're allowed at least one in each PG-13 movie, so that'll okay, be our one cool. for this episode. Great. I will do my best to make us again. Um, <laughs> okay. But, <laughs> um, you know, just like this idea of like, oh yeah, no, I actually don't care about these people as people and they don't actually care about me as a human. So why would I sacrifice uh, being able to wear soft pants all of the time for you? Yeah. Uh, I prioritize that as well was and you did you guys already mention that that's become an issue like workplaces are trying to get people to come back and then people are protesting and saying no or just like leaving jobs in order to avoid going back into offices since it's been demonstrated that you can work virtually just as effectively or even um, a lot of fast food places are having like major shortages um, and are having to like raise wages in order to bring people back because it turns out that paying like less than minimum wage is not like appealing for for most individuals or less yeah, than drove, less than a living wage at least right. I, I drove by a taco bell uh down here in you know rural southern oregon that was hiring for 14 25 an hour mm -hmm. mm. yeah yeah so um that's an interesting dynamic and it'll be interesting to see how this the solar eclipse in gemini and, and the intensification of some of that of the social aspect of things but also some of the drawbacks to that comes back into focus mm -hmm. yeah and so this saturn uranus stuff like there's going to be the, this like the more interesting crypto stuff will happen more dramatic events um and also more um in addition to this sort of underlying change in relationship to labor for a lot of people we'll probably also see more dramatic um attempts at unionization or strikes in certain industries etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. yeah which is just reminding me even of like the um like the farmers strike in india and like you know uranus and taurus the change of how we access food um you know one thing that somebody was mentioning recently is even the um 
you know, it's like it's so dry in California right now. <laughs> and last year during fire season, um, you know, all of the concern about far farm workers who already work in really challenging conditions, working in a pandemic when there are additionally um, heavy pressures on their lungs because it's fire season. Um, and like, what does that look like this year when we're pretty much basically in a drought, also still in some form of a panorama, um, we'll have fire season, we'll have Saturn Uranus ongoing story too. And then well, what does that do to access to food? Um, well, so. Yeah, so let's, let's bring Mars in a fire sign. Into yeah. This. I feel like it's, <laughs> oh, we're already there. Mm -hmm. So what happens later in the month, Chris? Uh, that's a great transition. So first, I'm going to show this graph that was made by, again, Kyle from Archetypal Explorer, which shows the arc of the second Saturn-Uranus square going exact here in June. But then also, right around that time, Mars goes into the sign of Leo and begins a pretty quick ramp up to an exact opposition with Saturn and a square with Uranus, which even though it doesn't go exact until the very beginning of July, those are going to be super close by the end of June. So we're not just having Saturn square Uranus, but also Mars making a hard aspect. Before we fully break that down, though, this might be a good opportunity to mention this program that I keep getting these graphics from, which is our sponsor this month, which is Archetypal Explorer. So are you both you both have seen seen the graphics from this program that we've been using for the past few years? Mm hmm. Yeah. And it's it's such an excellent visual representation of like application and separation. Um, yeah, you know, like and just even having the like for me at least having the visual and imagining like the Sisyphean like push up the mountain towards the peak of the aspect, um, and then the roll down on the other side. Yeah, because that's exactly how I conceptualize aspects. And Patrick and I just released, we did a recorded an episode a few days ago on using the ephemeris to like track, you know, people used to use an ephemeris to calculate charts by hand. But nowadays, one thing that an ephemeris is still really good for, even if you're not doing that, is tracking your transits. And that's really how I think about and conceptualize transits. So it's nice to have a visual reference um, that really shows that at this point. Uh, so, Archetypal Explorer is a um, online program. It's based on a subscription service, so there's no major commitment to it, which is kind of nice. Where you don't have to plunk down like three or four hundred dollars like some other astrology programs. Instead, you just sign up for a monthly service at archetypalexplorer.com. You can plug your natal chart into it, and it'll show you both mundane transits that are going on in the world in general in different graphs with different outer planet aspects, and they're periods of activity and inactivity. Um, but you can also run your own natal transits. And one of my favorite features is that it will send you an email at the top of each month that gives you a breakdown of what your major outer planet transits are over the course of the next four weeks. And I actually use that to sort of pay attention to what outer planets are sort of operative at any given time for me during the course of a month or during the course of a year. Um, so it has an animate chart feature so that you can use that to move forward and backwards in time to study different transits over the course of a year, which is super helpful like we do on the forecast episodes. And um, it also incorporates some interpretations for different transits um, based on the work of Richard Tarnas and his book Cosmos and Psyche. So it's kind of useful having some basic interpretation stuff as well. So um, you can sign up for that and get a free seven-day trial period if you want to just try it out and get started at archetypalexplorer.com. And thanks to Kyle and shout out to him for making a lot of the great transit graphs uh, that we use. These are straight from his program each month. So we really appreciate supporting his work just because it's such a great way to visualize all these transits that we talk about each month. All right. So I like I like that he uh uh it's marketed to the savvy enthusiast. Yes. Who wouldn't not, who wouldn't like to regard themselves as a savvy enthusiast? Not it's, the unsavvy enthusiast. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the opposite end of this, but the unsavvy enthusiast would be a um yeah, well maybe we don't, we don't have to go there, but only if you're a sav savvy enthusiast for archetypal explorer. <laughs> All right. So let's go back to our Mars ingress. So Saturn square Uranus, and then Mars goes into Leo 
on the 11th of June. And this is kind of like a seismic shift because this is when we get a trigger that's really going to emphasize some of those things that are already there and already present with the Saturn Uranus square. And it's just going to um, accentuate or exacerbate or perhaps inflame some of those tensions between those two outer planets even more in a way that might be much more tangible and much more urgent for some reason. Mm -hmm. Feels yeah, like definitely. a sharpening, a sharpening of something that already feels pokey. Uh, yeah, I mean, turning the temperature up mm -hmm. on all a the hot, same dynamics. A hot poker instead of a cold poker, maybe. <laughs> mm. And just um, a, on a simple level, um, whenever the moon, uh, the moon's first day in a uh, in a fixed sign for the next, I don't know, month and a half. Um, as well, especially the next month, um, once Mars goes in, um, will not will be a rather inauspicious days from a an almanac point of view. So, just you know, if you live in the Americas and probably in Europe too, it'll be day after if you're in Australia or whatever. But um, the 14th, the 20th, and the 26th, the Moon will be tangling with Saturn, Uranus, and Mars, um, and so those are just you know. The, those are maybe use those as anti elections, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah, I like doing that every once in a while. Just pick like the worst chart that you can for something really like low level, like ordering food or you know going for a walk and just see what happens. Uh, Patrick actually had a funny story about that on Twitter recently, where he got stung by a bee and uh, getting out of a pool. He was like going swimming, and as an astrologer, of course, what's the first thing you do? You like cast the chart for the moment, and it pulled it up on his phone. And Mars was exactly culminating on the midheaven at the time and squaring the ascendant. And he said that the degree of the ascendant was at nine degrees of Libra, which is actually exactly natally where his Mars is in his birth chart. Mm. So mm -hmm. funny, funny little anecdote. I do that from time to time. Have either of you had events like that where you've had something you cast the chart for that moment and for some reason it actually describes things rather well, or you see like an angular planet or something? Um it happens. I usually just, uh, I usually think of it in terms of like transits that I already knew were happening. I usually, I actually don't usually cast like the time of day. Like, you know, when I hurt my back uh, around the, the turn of the year, I was like, yeah, Mars is uh, square my goddamn ascendant, right? Like by degree. I was like, I, n n enough said, right? I didn't feel the need to investigate further. It would be interesting. Uh, I could go back. I know about what time of day, but usually I'm just like, ah, it's that transit, or if it's a perfection thing, aggravated by transit, or you know, whatever. Um, I tend to think of it in those terms, but I don't know. Maybe it's the Jupiter on the rising. I want to just kind of move on. I would recommend it. It's one of it's one of the advantages we have in like 21st century astrology is just the fact that you can like cast a chart on your phone. Like I'll keep you can pull up. Astro Gold and just like look at what the chart is for the moment or pull up Solar Fire and look at the animate chart clock and it'll tell you what the configurations are. And what's really weird is like sometimes when something important happens, you will see a planet angular at that time that actually speaks to what just happened. So for example, I remember like a year or two ago, I was out to eat back, you know, in pre-COVID days before the time of troubles. And um I was supposed to meet with somebody later that day for an important business meeting, and I got a text, and they said the meeting is canceled because I just got in a car accident and I can't meet up with you today. And I just looked at the chart of the moment, and Saturn was exactly on the degree of the midheaven at that moment when I got this message that the the meeting was off. And it's something sometimes as simple as that, and that doesn't sound like a big deal, but in the moment it can be very interesting and can sort of tell you something and is a good lesson um especially using inceptional or electional astrology mm -hmm. yeah i yeah, mean what go ahead oh go ahead i was just say it's astrology in action in motion mm -hmm. in the wild yeah um so one thing like i, I have decided that i'm going to go ahead and share this but like this past weekend um i had an incident with somebody that i met on a dating app um and so i looked back at the very first message that this person sent me and the um, the chart for the very first message had Pluto right on the descendant, and the uh, collapse of that particular connection had everything to do with uh, uh, power issues. 
um, like power dynamic issues. I thought that was really interesting. So I always like to, like my, my friends and I will talk about this. It's important to save not just the date, but the time of the very first message that you get from someone. Yes. Um, and that can actually tell you quite a lot about how something unfolds. So totally. That is, yeah. it can like, also that, make you re- extremely paranoid. Yes. <laughs> right. Like I don't but recommend just, doing yeah. it like you know. as soon as they message you. Like, I don't think that's super useful, but like to look back, super yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and just well, because and you're the... paranoid doesn't mean you're wrong. <laughs> but, you know, um, <laughs> as, as du- every double edged sword. Yeah. Yeah. For, foreknowledge is not necessarily pleasant. Mm-hmm. The double edged sword of astrology and the blurry line between um, useful thing you're integrating in your life versus overly. I don't know, neurotic, or I don't know what the term is at this point for obsessing about something. It can go either way pretty mm-hmm. easily. Yeah, it can certainly yeah. feed into negative thought patterns that we're mm-hmm. fully capable of developing without astrology, but then astrology yes. can nourish and help grow strong. Yeah. yeah. But that being said, that doesn't, maybe that needs to be an episode is uh, dating as an astrologer in the 21st century and tips for yeah, pros astrological tips. Yeah, pros and cons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll have to we'll have to think about that episode. I'll workshop that. Um, where were we? What were we talking about? Well, you'd be taking that. You could do it as a pro con. You could uh, you could take the pro paranoia stance. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's actually that's a really good episode. I did kind of do an episode vaguely like that, but the pros and cons of dating an astrologer or how to date an maybe it should be more like how to date an astrologer if you're a non non astrologer. <laughs> Just to give I feel like that could get really weird really quickly. That's true. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh let's refocus. Oh yeah, we were talking about the burnt path, which is like the second half of this month of Mars going into Leo and the just like increase of tensions that starts rap, r- ramping up pretty dramatically because here in the chart we can see here's July 1st and this is like Mars exactly opposing Saturn and at 12 degrees of Aquarius and then a couple days later it exactly squares Uranus at 13 Taurus um but that aspect really starts building up as soon as Mars makes that ingress on June 11th and June 12th of um, moving into that fixed sign and activating that sign-based opposition with Saturn and the sign-based square with Uranus. And it just starts growing intensity from that point forward. Yeah, I think it's worth noting that this is the day after the eclipse in Gemini. Um, And one of the things that I've been paying attention to, I don't really have a delineation for this, but I think it's really interesting to watch, is that that eclipse in Gemini happens within a minute of an exact sextile to where Mars and Venus will meet in Leo um, later in July. So that's more, you know, getting into the astrology of July than June, but I do think that is, like, it's worth paying attention to the fact that when Mars is in Leo, it will be approaching a conjunction with Venus. Nice. Mm -hmm. I like that. So the eclipse is at 19 Gemini, and then that Venus-Mars conjunction takes place at 19 Leo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like a really tight, like, you know, by like an arc minute of, of a sextile. Interesting. So somebody that has like natal planets at 19 degrees of certain signs. So let's say like fixed signs maybe, or some signs configured to those degrees that could end up being important and related transits for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Mars's movement into Leo certainly ratchets up a variety of existing tensions, but it also means that um, we have two benefics, uh, Jupiter and Venus, both in happy, happy water signs that aren't getting challenged or contested at all. Like the benefics and the malefics really kind of um, pair off to do separate things. Um, Like the benefics are having a great time here with Jupiter and Pisces and Venus and Cancer, and then the malefics are all preparing for you know, war. Right. That's a great point because there's this weird contrast between the the wateriness of having that emphasis of the benefics both in water signs during that portion of the month and that contrast with Mars suddenly being in Leo and 
opposing Saturn and Aquarius. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, um, it, it, it's, you know, there's just a huge, all, almost all of the difficulties are in fixed, uh, fixed signs. Whereas like, you know, if we, we look at, you know, what is it like to be mutable or what is it like to be cardinal during this period of time? Um, you've got at least one benefic angular and no malefics angular. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, all right. So Venus going through cancer. Um, what else do we, so Jupiter stations here on the 21st, my, my electional chart for this month actually happens. It's not because Mars, um, goes into Leo, but it's able to happen as a result of that, because then we catch that nice moon Venus conjunction in cancer while Jupiter is still in Pisces. So would this be a good time to introduce that? Mm -hmm. Sure. All right. So, uh, each month, uh, Lisa and I, Lisa Scheim and I do a podca podcast called the Auspicious Elections Podcast, where we pick out a series of four or five electional charts that are auspicious for starting different types of ventures and undertakings using the principles of electional astrology. And we, on the public uh, forecast episode, we always feature one electional chart. And our featured election this month takes place on June 12th, 2021. Uh, very late at night at about 12.30 a.m. And what you want to do is you want to cast a chart for June 12th, and then you want to adjust the ascendant until the ascendant in your location, whatever city you're living in, is at about two degrees of Pisces. And that will roughly be the electional chart that we have picked out for this month. So the election this month is primarily a Jupiter election with Jupiter in Pisces. So it is a night chart. It's not a day chart, which would be a little bit more optimal, but um, it is still pretty good for Jupiter, where it has Jupiter at two degrees of Pisces and the ascendant at two Pisces. So Jupiter is ruling the ascendant and placed on the degree of the ascendant in the first whole sign house. There's also an auspicious Moon Venus conjunction in the fifth house in Cancer at 11 degrees of Cancer. So this is a very watery election, and it's very much focused on. Um, those two water signs of Jupiter and Pisces and the Moon and Venus in Cancer in the Moon's domicile. This is also a night chart, so Venus is fully benefic. And um, yeah, so, so some of the things that this chart would be good for are things related to Jupiter or things related to Venus and fifth house activities. So creative pursuits or creative things is probably a great use of this election. Um, for fifth house matters, we don't usually have this, but one of the things that this could be good for is things related to like fertility or other things like that um, as a fifth house election. Uh, what other things would you guys use this election for if you're shooting for like a Jupiter election or a fifth house election with an auspicious Moon Venus conjunction? Hmm. I would think honestly about um, like nourishing midnight. Uh, spiritual practices <laughs> honestly mm. like you know beyond uh you know actively avoiding getting pregnant if that's not something you want to be doing right. um but yeah that's that's honestly the first thing that's coming to mind is like um if you're somebody who does like creative devotional work um i feel like this could be really facilitative of starting a project of some kind for that yeah for sure, creative things or creative pursuits or artistic pursuits would be a great use of this chart. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that is our electional chart for this month. It is still during a Mercury retrograde, but that's happening pretty much the entire month, so you can't really get away from that. Um, but it is just after the Mercury Kazemi where it conjoined the Sun, so it's in the second half of the retrograde cycle where some of the retrograde stuff that starts at the beginning of the retrograde usually starts to take a turn and starts to head towards being cleared up a little bit. So it's at least in the better second half of the retrograde cycle rather than the first half. Uh, but yeah, otherwise that's our electional chart for this month. So we also found, I think, four or five other electional charts. So you can find out more information about that by signing up for our page on Patreon at patreon.com slash the astrology podcast. Uh, to get access to those other electional charts for other auspicious days during the course of June. All right, so um, that's the electional chart for the month. Back to Mars in Leo. 
Um, what else needs to be said about that or, or what hasn't been mentioned that we meant to talk about in terms of um, that and intensifying or creating a more acute sense of the Saturn-Uranus square? Because it's a little bit tricky because Saturn and Uranus is starting to separate at this point in the second half of June, but then Mars comes through and almost um, you know, an ancient and medieval astrology would say translates the light between Saturn and Uranus, and therefore, in some sense, may reactivate that square in some way. Oh yeah, well, I would just I would say rather keep it active because mm. they they really haven't had an, they really haven't had the chance to flow apart very far. But yeah, whatever like point. whatever decline we would you know expect to start seeing, um, we'll get the opposite of that. Got it. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to think of what other tensions we've mentioned. The GameStop things. Um, we've mentioned some of the the crowd and social things that seem to have hit like a fever pitch in uh, you know January and February, and there was the Capitol insurrection. Um, are there any other things or scenarios that we should be talking about or thinking about in terms of that? Well, the 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 future of work and money is we also covered those, right? Mm -hmm. And this like this sort of flocking together or flash mob um, sort of style of coming together to disrupt things, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, one other thing I don't want to get into too much because it's outside of my range, but. Um, there's also the ongoing conflict between Israel and Palestine and everything that's happening there. Um, Israel, of course, is founded with a Leo stellium, so that could be tricky with Mars ingressing into that sign in the second half of the month. and makes me a little bit nervous in terms of that, but that's otherwise not an area that I have much background or much of an astrological take on. So um, that was pretty much all I have to say in terms of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and as I mentioned, like I am concerned about fire seasons this year. Right. And like earlier, maybe earlier than usual fire seasons. Yet yeah, I've been, you know, we, we get fires here. Um, and last year it got, uh, the fires got way closer uh, than they ever have before. And so I've been thinking a lot about fire season coming into this year. Um, and will fire season in the the Western U.S. especially, um, and it, it really is like this contest between like that Mars Saturn Uranus um, can absolutely start uh, start fires earlier in the season, but we also have like Jupiter in a water sign, and we have Venus in a water sign, like like a, a very capable uh, set of fire extinguishers, and it, so it's really it. it um, I've just been looking at this contest and been like, okay, so, you know, who's who's going to win, right? Or can 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 Jupiter, especially being in a water sign for several months at a time where filling the water table and making the plants juicy is really important? You know, can it offset things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one other one other thing that's been happening over the course of the past month and. I'm not sure what that full astrological take is on it, but just um, the COVID numbers in India just going crazy and going through the roof, and that becoming a real major um, issue there over the course of the past month. And I know one person pointed out that there was a, a solar eclipse last year that um, crossed large portions of northern India, and that maybe being a relevant astrological indication that sort of preceded that, or maybe connected with some. Um, actions or decisions that were taking taken that then precipitated some of the crisis that's going on now. I'm not sure otherwise what um, the main astrological takeaway is from that. Uh, it's kind of a tricky thing when you're doing mundane astrology for countries because oftentimes you don't have very good or very well timed inception charts for different countries, especially countries that have been around for you know thousands of years and questions about what chart should you should you or can you use to represent like an entire country? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that also brings up the question of like how um, how long does an eclipse effect count? 
right? Or like how long can you, like how far back in history can you be like, oh, well, you know, started a year ago, five years ago, 12 years ago, um, which I know like Saros cycles kind of answer that to a degree, um, but it still is kind of a tricky question. Yeah, it is tricky. And that's one of the areas like timing with eclipses is really tricky. Um, it makes me think of, for example, like the the Great American Eclipse that happened in the summer of 2017. And I always associate that with the beginning of Trump's presidency, even though it occurred like six six months into it already after his inauguration. Um, that was still like the beginning of that four-year period and wondering if that was in a way sort of like an omen of his um, you know, period in office and some of the things that happened in the country subsequent to that. And sometimes it does give me a little bit more of a feeling of not negotiability, but um, that that the timeframes for eclipses sometimes could be squishier than we might think with other transits, partially because they could relate to actions that take place at that time where the outcome isn't visible until much later or may have lingering effects that aren't clear um, until sometimes a ways down the line. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So um, I agree with all of that, but I would also add as, I don't know, sort of a complementary point, not necessarily a counterpoint. Um, there were also fires all over the area in the Northwest where the, uh, like right when that eclipse happened, because it entered in the Northwest, and then there were watery disasters in the exit wound in the Southeast, like immediately. Like there was some long term stuff, but there was literally like fire and water disaster on both sides of like bullet in and bullet out of mm-hmm. the, the continental United States. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so often that's one of the tricky things with timing and astrology because there often is a simultaneous event that, cur- that occurs simultaneous with the transit, but then sometimes something is initiated at that time that starts a foundational chart itself, which then grows and develops over the future or sometimes over years past that point. I mean, that's one of the issues even that we have in natal astrology is sometimes we think about uh, events that happened, for example, um, the invention of the internet or at least the full rollout of the internet with Saturn and Aquarius in the early 1990s. Um, and then how that would grow and develop over the course of the past 30 years. But then also there were individuals that were born at that time that have Saturn and Aquarius, and many of them are coming into like full maturity now as they're experiencing their Saturn return, and we're seeing them carry out some of those energies into their life as adults in a way that wasn't like immediately apparent when they were just born as babies or what have you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, or companies founded during that time that are still around. Mm-hmm. Mm, right. Or marriages founded during that time that are collapsing. Yeah. That might be related to people who are related to the internet and computers. <laughs> yeah. Well so that was one of the <laughs> news stories this month was um, that Bill and Melinda Gates announced that they were getting divorced. And all the headlines said that after after 27 years of marriage, and like every astrologer I know, their ears like perked up. At that number, because 27, of course, is about a Saturn cycle. And sure enough, they got married when Saturn was in Aquarius back in the early 1990s. And now Saturn's returned back to that sign and they're evidently calling it quits. So, uh, what was interesting about that is I kind of called a little bit ahead of time where I said, um, because we have Bill Gates' birth time and he has Cancer rising. And I was kind of like, well, that means that he just got out of Saturn going through his seventh house of marriage and relationships for the past three years. And I bet their marriage actually broke down during that time. And then it was just now that they're ready to go with it publicly and, and start splitting up their assets that they're announcing it with Saturn and Aquarius. And then it came out later that indeed um, she did approach like divorce lawyers back in 2019 or something like that, which would have been during the course of Saturn in Capricorn going through his seventh house. So um, there may have been some problems there privately that are only com- becoming public at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and it's funny to think just as a transit that it's Saturn in the eighth, and the eighth is shared assets. And so there's going to be a tremendous amount. It's going to take an army of people to separate those shared assets. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, definitely. I wonder if that'll get rancorous when Mars opposes that Saturn. 
Oof. Mm, we'll see. Um, Saturn. Is rancorous a word? <laughs> I know rancor is. is a word. It's yeah, it's a word. wordish. It's a yeah. word now. You might be featured in the dictionary at some point in the future for for inventing that. If it's not, um, so the other thing about that, of course, is um, you know it ties in also to Saturn cycles, and sometimes you can see certain things as a continuation of events that already occurred, or there were echoes of that from earlier in the person's life. Uh, like this is going to be Bill Gates's uh, waxing Saturn square. So you'd expect some piece of this story to be a continuation of events that were occurring back around the time of his Saturn return when Saturn was going through Scorpio. And um, I was researching this a little bit, and like Melinda Gates said that they did have a real period of of tension and almost breaking up back around that time period when Saturn was going through Scorpio around the 2012-2013 time frame um, over like trying to co-author a newsletter together or something like that. Mm -hmm. And where he had authored their foundation's newsletter for years, but then she said that she wanted to start co-authoring it with him and he didn't want to for some reason. And then eventually there was a huge fight over it, but eventually he sort of gave up some ground. And then she wrote a little addendum to it one year. And then the following year, they ended up co-authoring it together. So it seems like they were able to overcome that tension back then and stayed together. But then now that we see Saturn going to Aquarius and hitting the square with that natal position, um, it you know the, that that story has like a different turn at this point, where they're not able to resolve the conflict that's sort of ind- indicated by Saturn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so so interesting to see how those sorts of things unfold over time. Yeah, well, it's just it's important in terms of knowing because one of my students in my Hellenistic course was asking a good question, which is, could you have called ahead of time that this would be them getting a divorce versus other scenarios of, like, say, like the death of a partner or something like that? And part of the answer is, is no, not without any context whatsoever. That it's partially the context of the chart and the situation that the person is in. But also the trajectory of past, especially when it involves a Saturn transit, the trajectory of past Saturn transits, especially through the Saturn cycle and its hard aspects to itself, that tells you what this transit is going to be about as a continuation of a previous 30 year narrative and like story. So it's really important in terms of predicting with long term cycles to understand their trajectory. Of the person's life with respect to that transit, because once you understand the tra- trajectory, you can usually anticipate what you know the next hard aspect of Saturn is going to be seven years later, or fourteen years later, or twenty-seven years later, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's also something to um, the you know, like the context not only of like that person's individual life, but how it is intersected with the people that are involved with whatever the story is. Um, you know, like if we had, um, Melinda's chart, for example, um, and being able to look both at the synastry and even like any composite charts and how that then adds depth to the astrological story, um, which is additional context for, um, what actually happens to the individual chart and the individual life. Yeah, for sure. And it's all those, the way those charts overlap and intersect with each other that creates the specific, or at least reflects the specific outcome of any transit or, or manifestation of certain placements. And that's something that's so hard to, to call ahead of time unless you're paying attention to all of those overlapping or intersecting charts as the, as the astrologer. So that actually came up also with the episode I did with Lisa earlier this month about Tips for getting an astrological consultation. And one of our tips was that um, don't treat your astrologer as a mind reader and don't test the astrologer because usually, actually, the more context you give for an astrological consult- consultation about where your life is at now, the better a job they're going to be able to do of making statements or predictions about your future by knowing and seeing the current trajectory. Yeah. And I, w- I would add to that that 
that uh, there's also an argument for once you've gotten a reading from astrology, you really like their perspective, they're good, they're useful, you connect well, like um, sticking with that person because that person will get better at reading for you because they've they've like seen you, you know, they've seen all that they saw the first time and maybe the second or the third or whatever. Um, and so, you know, they, they have more of a database in a sense of how your chart reacts to transits. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, like, I like to think of it, um, sort of ecologically where it's like, you can have a map of a given forest, but that doesn't actually tell you that much. Like you can know, like these species are here. Okay. But like, how are they assembled? Like, what is the biome? Like the more often you visit that place, the more, um, intelligently you can talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Or um, and map, uh, maps ironically become more valuable when you're familiar with the terrain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Or just like you don't go to your doctor and and tell them to guess what your like symptoms are and what your <laughs> issue is. You um, similarly, that's not mm -hmm. as productive. I mean, they might be able to like infer if you look like really sickly or you're you know lying on your side in pain, but or literally um, bleeding. Out of right. a specific location, <laughs> yeah. Although, fair, but also, uh, if you've ever been to like a really good TCM person, like I, I had somebody um, within four minutes of meeting me took my pulse and then described a heart condition on my dad's side of the family um, that's totally there. Wild. Okay, but yeah. that's still somebody picking up on information that. Uh, like some part of you is telling them they're not just only just glancing at you. Oh no, they I are. Mean, they're trained. Uh, yeah. probably spent a thousand hours doing pulse diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when there's some astrologers that are really, I mean, I've seen like a YouTube video. I thought about interviewing this guy. It has like a million views of the, some astrologer who's really good at guessing a person's rising sign or their sun sign based on just their appearance or something like that and and maybe there's some astro some small percentage of astrologers that really excel at that but not all astrologers are like super good at just like guessing something from a stranger after meeting them for like 5 seconds right one well, that's not probably not the most important skill or it's not the most useful skill to the client um that said i think a lot of astrologers, especially if you have, you know you read for a lot of clients, um, you get pretty good at just looking at the chart and be like, "Oh, okay, like that that transit to that blah blah blah." Like that's why you're coming, right? Like it's like, well, of course we're going to talk about that, and sometimes that's um, you know that's what's uh, described, and sometimes it's not. But some sometimes it's very clear, um, and when. Um, also looking at the consultation chart, um, especially if it doubles down, um, on one of those factors, um, it, you know, that's, that can be very powerfully confirmatory, but it's not always clear. And unlike, um, going to a doctor for a, an acute medical issue, there's not always a problem. Right. And, <laughs> you know, the, like sometimes like the, it, it's, it's more of a, like, I would like to, you know, do a little bit more recon on the next six months, or I would like to continue improving in this area rather than, you know, my foot is bleeding. Right. Like getting a lifting coach after you've been lifting for a while versus going to the physical therapist because you've gotten injured. Yeah. Or sometimes just out of curiosity, which is a fine, acceptable reason to visit an astrologer as well. You don't always need to have to have some issue that you need to like work out or or fix or get ish get answers to. Mm -hmm. Um that actually reminds me the like, consultation chart you mentioning that Austin that uh Patrick and I were also talking about recently just how well sometimes the consultation chart or just or a horary chart the placement of the ruler of the ascendant sometimes telling you exactly what the person is focused on at that time and having the ruler of the ascendant in like the seventh house and they want to talk about relationships or the tenth house and career or things like that. It's a really funny aspect of horror, especially that um, I'm always impressed by. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, let's get back to the forecast and finish sort of breaking down sequentially the the last of the month. So we've talked a lot about the Saturn Uranus 
square. We've talked about that getting amped up uh, by Mars. What are some of the other aspects that we need to touch on later in the month, especially? Um, I know eventually, for example, it's a little tricky because Mars slows down and eventually stations um, direct later in the month. So we have, or, or sorry, Mercury slows down and stations direct in Gemini. So we have the end of the Mercury retrograde period, just as some of the tensions with Mars and Saturn are really ramping up, which is a bit of a contradiction to me. But at least for some people, if you're really tied into this specific Mercury retrograde for some reason, then there should at least be some conclusion to whatever the issue was that was set up at the beginning of the retrograde in late May or early June. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, one thing that's interesting to note is that um, Mercury's direct station and the Sun's ingress into Cancer um, aren't very far apart, and so that's that's a that gives a, the last third of the month a tone that's distinct from the first two thirds, mm, right? So what is that? Is that the twentieth and twenty first? Twenty second, yeah. Okay, twenty second. So those couple over those couple days. Um, we get we get that shift. Boy, the um, looking at it now, the the sun's uh, trine with Jupiter for the first two degrees of Cancer is lovely. Mm -hmm. That's what actually I was about to mention is with like Jupiter stationing retrograde. That means it's trying the sun, and I find that it's it's like really beautiful to have that at solstice. Um, like there's something nourishing about that and that's you know not only because of the sun in cancer but the fact that um that's jupiter's exaltation place and it's saying hi from its rulership um there's something very sweet about that yeah i really like that somebody was um the owner of the mercury cafe in downtown denver was asking me for an electional chart for selling the business um, but wanted to sell it to somebody who would continue on some of the um, important community and local organizational efforts that they've always hosted there, which includes like activism things, but also things like our local astrology group. And um, they asked me for a chart where they wanted it to be on the summer solstice or around the summer solstice uh, within that time frame. And that was one of the nice things that, you know, as a Sometimes as an electional astrologer, you don't like having restrictions on things, like it has to be on this day or within a day or two of it, but it actually worked out pretty well finding the chart for that just because um, as soon as the sun moves into Cancer, like you were saying, it's applying to that nice trine with Jupiter at two degrees of Pisces right on the summer solstice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that kind of takes us to our last lunation of the month, which is the full moon in Capricorn on the 24th. And one thing that's great about that is that the both the sun and the moon have a very close and pleasing uh, angle on Jupiter. Uh, the moon has a nice uh, sextile within mm, looks like degree and a half, and then the the sun is it's past the perfect trine, but only like a degree and a half, right? And so that's still very strong. And so Jupiter, Jupiter gets to you know we get Jupiter, um, I don't know, blessing both the sun and the moon there. Um, which I think we could probably use mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> based on some of the other transits. <laughs> yeah, that is a nice, soft uh, full moon, which is also not an eclipse, which is a nice thing coming out of eclipse season, but also coming out of the past few years of eclipses that kept bouncing back and forth between Capricorn and Cancer. Yeah, you know, this reinforces to me what I was seeing earlier um, and saying earlier about the malefics and the benefics really kind of going there, uh, splitting up into separate teams and doing different stuff. Because even as, um, as you know, the Mars Saturn thing, Mars Saturn Uranus thing is tightening um, uncomfortably, um, boy, like Cancer and Pisces just look like a party or like, um, or a spa or a, you know, whatever, something, something nourishing, refreshing, joyful. Um, there's so much easy stuff going on. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes me think that um, like this sort of separation of the planets makes me think that some people are going to have an awesome 
like end of June, early July, and some people are going to have a terrible one. It's not going to be it's not going to be evenly distributed because we have all mm-hmm. the kind of all the good over here and all the rough over there. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, it just keeps making me think of how much like last year, for example, Kelly was talking about in the 2020 year ahead forecast, her original the original reason why she started talking about March being like no hugs March or whatever the what was the phrase? Like it was a really great, like prescient phrase um ahead of time. It were I mean, we were talking about how foreboding and cold the Mars Saturn Pluto in uh, Capricorn was and um yeah Kelly was translating that to relational terms and was you know no hugging mm-hmm. yeah and and she was focused on elementally like the dryness of all those planets being in Capricorn especially and this is really the opposite of that and it's sort of a return to um the sort of wetness of social interaction and the reconnecting of like like emotions and um, just connections between people on an emotional level that perhaps come as a result of um, interacting again and being close again or being in person again and some of those interpersonal relationships being reinvigorated as a result of uh, that shared connection. So for some people, I think it probably has to do with that, which is like the reintroduction of some of those relationships or the formation of new ones. And some of the deep, sort of emotionally, sort of healing um, feelings that come with that, just as a result of being able to build those connections with people again. Mm-hmm. I, I like yeah. it. It's a uh, it's like rehydrating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And like you've got freeze dried food or lives, <laughs> but it's like <laughs> rehydrating them. Or those. What are the little um, uh, the little things uh, that I don't know if children still sea have sea monkeys. These. Not see, right. um, we're all there like, like the these, sea monkeys. There were like these of... little spongy capsules when I was oh, a the kid. Dinosaurs, you, like yeah, the dinosaurs, yeah, the dinosaurs spongy things. Put them in the water, yeah. and then they they get like ten times as big, and you know, are are a fun dinosaur, or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't remember what those are called. But they like but spring back them. to life. Yeah, or, you know, like you know, or even and, thinking about like Rose of Jericho, right? Mm-hmm. Which you know these dried up balls of nothing and then you put it in water and it becomes this beautiful green fern. Oh, right. Yeah, and like those four minutes, those, those yeah. like tea, tea balls. That's like a tea thing that you put in a tea jar and then you put hot water on it and it ex- expands into like a mm-hmm. beautiful flower out of a like dried out husk. Yeah. So we are, we are all after 2020 that, that dried out husk of a flower. And now with Jupiter stationing in Pisces and, uh, Venus transiting through Cancer, uh, a lot of us are going to experience the rehydrating of our uh, emotional and I don't know, maybe even to some extent, sort of spiritual selves with the reconnection of um, with other humans and and other ways to rehyd- whatever it is that rehydrates us in our lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I like that. That's kind of an, an optimistic note. Uh, one final thing that's actually connected with that, and it's something easy to overlook, and I don't know that we have a lot to say about it, but just after that lunation, uh, that full moon in Capricorn, uh, Neptune actually stations in Pisces as well. So there's a little bit of an intensification of Neptune in Pisces' significations at the same time, which probably just emphasizes a lot of what we were just talking about, about those water signs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little more of the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Brilliant. Um, then Venus eventually leaves Cancer and moves into Leo on the 26th, but that really just takes us into some of that emphasis on the fixed sign axis and the Leo Aquarius axis that's really going to come to dominate, especially the early part of next month when some of those aspects go exact. So that might be something we can we can save for save for then. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. All right. Um, any final things we need to mention or that we completely overlooked and forgot to talk about when it comes to the astrology of June? Hmm. I don't think so. Yeah, seem I think we were pretty thorough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we covered just about everything. All right, awesome. Well, 
Uh, what do both of you have coming up? Diana, I know the first thing you have coming up is you're speaking at like a major online conference that's happening next week. Right. So I'm speaking, um, I'm giving two lectures and also uh, sitting on a panel for the Northwest Astrological Conference. Um, so my first lecture is, is that right? Yeah. The first one is re-envisioning Juno. Um, and I'll be talking about the asteroid Juno and what I have kind of come to conclude through observation and practice, as well as collecting information from people with prominently placed Junos in their charts going beyond the super heteronormative marriage focus that sometimes if you just do casual research, you'll come across. Um, and then on Sunday, I'm doing a presentation on luminaries. So like the sun and the moon in the 12th house. And that one is turning out to be a little bit more experimental and experiential than informational, but I feel like that's appropriate for the 12th house. And then I think it's Saturday night. Um, I'm on a panel with um, Sam Reynolds, Stormy Grace, uh, and Gray Crawford um, talking about race and astrology. Um, so yeah, that's that's what's going on for Norwac. Um, and then one of the other major things that I've been working on is actually a course on uh, plants and planets. Um, the intersection of these things, the history of astro herbalism, uh, medical astrology, and things like that. Um, that's much more animistically focused, uh, relationship focused, um, versus you know giving you all the information you need to be a practitioner. Um, so that's a course that I'm putting together with my friend Sarah Corbett of Rowan and Sage, and we are planning on launching that towards the end of June, beginning of July. So super, super excited about that. Nice. That sounds awesome. And uh, what's your website or where can people find out more information about that? Yeah. So um, dot com and then my at for Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon is all Damashena. And that is spelled D-D-A-M-A-S-C-E-N-A-A. -A -A. Um, I know it's hard to spell, but if you just go to your site of choice and you type in Diana Rose, you will probably find me. So I'll yeah. put a link to that in the description page below this episode on YouTube and on the astrologypodcast.com website as well if people want to find out more information. And the conference that you're speaking at next week is at norwac.net. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Austin, what do you have going on? Um, I will be opening up my year one astrological curriculum here before too long. And let's see, what else am I doing? Um, well, um, probably by the time this comes out, but maybe almost exactly the time this comes out, Sphere and Sundry will be releasing uh, a super duper Saturn series um, that was uh, created last year um, to maximize the being able to use Jupiter and Capricorn, not to Jupiter, but to support and make more benefic the, uh, what, uh, uh, Saturnian purposes. Um, it's pretty neat. Um, so that'll be out by the end of May. I'm not sure exactly what day, but it'll be like right around the time this launches. And I don't know, I don't think I'm doing anything else public, probably make some stuff, you know, I teach some classes. I love that delay where you always pick out these amazing electional charts, and then you guys do some of these secret uh, workings and creating different things. But it's not until months or sometimes like a year later that you unveil it as this brilliant like electional thing that's been captured in a talisman or or something related from you know a sort of blast from the past. Yeah, it's um and um. Thank you for pointing that out. It's really an interesting experience. Uh, in some ways, the 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 series that are created are more distinct when you when you check in with them six months later. One because there's a there's almost a like a energetic fermentation that occurs, but also you're no longer in the time that that came from. Right? It's like talking to somebody who was alive during World War II. Right? Like you're like, wow, that's it's a different that's it, things are different now and you can really feel the quality of of what was 
uh, and that moment that isn't anymore, but that you can bring with you. Yeah, it's so much more distinct because you've stepped outside of it. And I keep getting that feeling ever since, especially this month with Jupiter in Pisces, but also the past few months that Jupiter's been in Aquarius, just how different that has been from Jupiter in Capricorn last year. Yeah, absolutely. I, I look forward to um, Kate um, calling and bottling this Jupiter in Pisces so that uh, <laughs> so I can come back to uh, the better moments of May 2021. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, people can check that out at sphereandsundry.com. And your website is austincopic.com, right? Yep. Brilliant. Um, as for me, I'm uh, just doing some tech and software stuff. I want to start producing more little short videos on the Astrology Podcast YouTube channel. So I'm going to start doing some tutorials for things like Solar Fire and Astro Gold. So keep an out, eye out for some tutorials for Astro Gold uh, sometime soon, because uh, that's going to be one of the main things I'm focusing on this month. And the only other thing I meant to mention is just. Um, my book, uh, Hellenistic Astrology: The Study of Fate and Fortune. People often, um, you know, see the podcasts, but because I don't plug the book regularly, because people, I assume everyone knows about it at this point, I just re- like was reminded that I actually should remind people that I wrote a book on ancient astrology where I outlined like the foundations of most of Western astrology, which largely came together about two thousand years ago. So if you want to learn more about some of the approach that we use here on the Astrology Podcast, I'd recommend checking that out and just ordering it from Amazon or Barnes and Noble or whatever local astrology, local bookstore you prefer to use. And uh yeah, you should be good. Yeah, you gotta bring Chris, you gotta bring the catchphrase back. You were you were uh, so good for years. Mm-hmm. Whenever you mentioned the book, it was always available in fine bookstores everywhere. I think I mean just I, I think Diana, like, we're both waiting for you to say it. Probably, yeah. Honestly. I was, I was. It felt unfinished to just say yeah. Hellenistic astrology, the study of fate and fortune, I available mean, I, in fine bookstores <laughs> everywhere. I want to, but I feel bad because it's like a lot of people haven't been in a bookstore for like a year, and uh, you but know, bookstores, books- bookstores need attending to. Bookstores need maintenance. We can't let them die. Right? That is a good point. So. That is a good point. So go go into your local bookstore, ask them if they don't have it to order you a copy of Hellenistic Astrology, the Study of Fate and Fortune, and then it will be available in fine bookstores everywhere, and you will help to fulfill the fate of the book. Yeah. You can call them also if you don't want to go in. A lot of bookstores have pickup just like your favorite restaurant does. That's a good point. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both. This has been uh, amazing. I had a really good time talking with you. It seems like we got into some really deep astrology stuff, which I always really enjoy. And yeah, I had a good time. So thanks a lot for for doing this forecast with me. Yeah. Thanks for having me uh, occupy Kelly's spot. I'm not ever going to say the word replace when it comes to Kelly because she's irreplaceable. So yeah, uh, yeah, definitely big shoes to fill since we've been doing that with her for the past five or six years. But Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you did an amazing job and it was fun talking with you and, and going over the astrology. So thanks a lot for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. This is yeah, awesome. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks also to our audience. We had a bunch of patrons who attended the live recording of this episode and we appreciate your comments and appreciate your support. So thanks a lot for joining us today. I guess that's it for the astrology for June. So we'll be back again next month uh, at the end of June for an episode on the astrology of July. So in the meantime, good luck, everybody, over the next few weeks. Uh, Let us know how it goes, and we'll see you again next time. Bye. Bye. Special thanks to all the patrons that supported the production of this episode of the Astrology Podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, thanks to the patrons on our producers tier, including Nate Craddock, Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Sumo Kopic, Nadia Habhab, Issa Sabah, Morgan McKinsey, and Jake Otero. For more information about how to become a patron and get access to exclusive subscriber benefits such as early access to new episodes, go to patreon.com slash astrologypodcast. Also, special thanks to our sponsors, including the Northwest Astrological Conference, which is happening online May 27th through the 31st, 2021, Find out more information at norwak.net. The Mountain Astrologer Magazine, which you can find out more information about at mountainastrologer.com. The Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, which you can find out more information about at honeycomb.co. 
also the Portland School of Astrology, more information at portlandastrology.org, the Astro Gold Astrology app, available for both iPhone and Android, available at astrogold.io, and finally, the primary software program that we use on episodes of the Astrology Podcast is called Solar Fire Astrology Software, which is available at alabe.com, and you can get a 15% discount with the promo code AP15.